All right. Hey, guys. My name is Terry. And Wei. Uh, we are from 1KX, an early stage crypto venture fund. Uh, we're here to present analysis of ZKVM designs. There's been a lot of iterations on works uh, in ZKVMs with different design choices, each with its own trade offs. And so we wanted to examine them, um, their concrete efficiency, and just sort of give you a higher level overview, as well as the design decisions involved as well. We're going to start off with what they are. Uh, why we need them. We're going to go into efficiency analysis in three parts, including ISA efficiency, arithmetization efficiency, and proof system efficiency. And then we're going to go into open questions. Uh, so what are ZKVMs and why do we need them? Um, the common comparison that a lot of people make between a ZKVM and a circuit is that of a general purpose processor and use case specific hardware. Um, a circuit is generally tends to be faster uh, because you have constraints that are tailor written for the specific computation at hand. In a ZKVM, you're often proving computation or execution of a general purpose VM, one that's widely used in practice. So you do get the advantages of taking advantage uh, of existing infrastructure, like, um, like compilers or you know, using higher level languages. Uh, but then the downside is, at the moment, they're about 10 to 100x slower. Um, circuits have been getting easier to use with custom DSLs, new DSLs. Um, and the core question that we have to ask then is, can we make ZKVMs faster as well? Uh, there's a rich history in the development of ZKVMs. Um, started with Tiny RAM in 2013, and then the first commercial work in 2021, as far as we know. Uh, in the past two years, there's especially been a lot of new ZKVMs um, tailored towards proving execution of existing and popular VMs today, like the EVM, WASM, or RISC-V. In the context of a ZKVM, you can think of a v we present like an abstraction of what a machine is. Um, it's specified by its memory, um, its instruction set architecture, as well as its internal machine state. Um, the ISA of a machine is basically a finite list of instructions with fixed semantics. Think about like the EVM set of opcodes, RISC-V, WASM. A program is a sequence of such instructions. The job of the machine is to read through each instruction at a time and then do one of five things, including things like reading and writing from memory or changing its internal machine state. So the ZK of the ZKVM, um, the job of it is to prove valid execution uh, of the machine, of the above machine, given uh, initial program, uh, initial inputs, as well as an uh, initial internal machine state. And you can roughly divide this into four parts. Uh, first, you have the setup, which uh, includes parameters of the ZKVM, things like max trace rows, fixed columns, um, hash functions, um, and creates a proving key and the verification key. In witness generation, you have an executor, which takes the program and the input, uh, and then is responsible for creating this array uh, of the execution trace, matrix of the execution trace, um, uh, which encodes the, the execution of the program um, and you know, also includes additional information that helps constrain the validity of the execution. Uh, this is also where you have the splitting of the program into many different parts for parallel proving. In the proving uh, phase, the prover takes the execution trace, the proving key, generates a proof, and then the verifier verifies this. Um, within a traditional machine, right, the core idea of efficiency is roughly correlated to the number of instructions in a program times the time it takes to actually execute the instruction, roughly. Uh, this translated into the context of a ZKVM. Um, we say this is the number of instructions in the program times you know, the, the constraint complexity per instruction. Uh, and so this is kind of like, because we're, we're um, developing something that's proof system agnostic, uh, think of it as kind of like the number of R1CS gates or the cells in a Plunkish circuit. Um, and then times the time it takes uh, to prove per constraint. Uh, and so we divide these three things into um, three different parts. One we call ISA efficiency, two uh, arithmetization efficiency, number three is proof system efficiency. Uh, so let's dive a little bit deeper into the ISA efficiency. Um, so traditional ISAs and, and ZK ISAs, they optimize for different things. So traditional processors, they're memory bound. Uh, but ZK ISAs, you have, generally speaking, um, one cycle per instruction. So they tend to be instruction bound. Another design decision that you can make is between a Harvard and a von Neumann machine. Um, in a Harvard machine, you have program and memory in separate locations. Uh, and so in this case, in the context of a ZKVM, um, you'll have something like a pre-processed lookup table and or a lookup table generated at witness time, and then the main execution trace looks up into that table. 
And then in a von Neumann machine, you have the program and memory in the same location. Uh, here, it's generally closer to modern CPUs, but the cons is that as you fetch instructions, uh, you do need to constrain correct instruction fetch. And at the um, initial phases of the program, you need to load the program into the memory. So there are more cycles that you use here. Um, another choice you make is between um, the internal state uh, the internal machine state memory model, which uh, you know there's like three uh, options that a lot of ZKVMs uh, are using today, the stack machine, the register machine, and the direct memory model. Um, in the stack machine, you generally have a lot of data movement operations to access the top of the stack. Uh, on the other hand, you get these simpler instructions. In a register machine, your instructions uh, tend to be shorter but more complex, but there are much less data movement operations. There still are between the stack and the registers, but you'll see later that it's much less than stack machines. And then in direct memory, you have zero data movement operations, but you do have a lot more read and write operations. Uh, so this is the current categorization landscape today. Um, <laughs> it's going to come back up later, so try to remember it, but um, yeah. So um, if you look at the actual instruction counts uh, per the different types of uh, machines, um, we took one round of SHA-256 compression, um, compiled it. Uh, there are obviously uh, caveats here in terms of like implementation efficiency or compiler efficiency. But as you can see, the first three stack-based machines uh, has significantly larger uh, local data movement operations um, compared to, say, like RISC-V or LLVMIR, which has virtual registers and therefore 0% uh, local data movement operations. Um, so like here, you can see um, in the actual assembly the uh, data movement operations specified here. Um, yeah, if we're specifically comparing um, RISC-V and WASM uh, across SHA-256 and Ketchak, you'll see that um, there's significantly less data movement operations in RISC-V compared to WASM, but then once you get to Kitchak, because you need to maintain you know, a little more like internal state, there are uh, equivalently a lot more um, data movement operations between the stack and the register for RISC-V there as well. So the core takeaway here is that um, stack machines have a lot of data movement ops, up to 50 to 60% for solidity. Register machines, meanwhile, um, they have good efficiency when register pressure is low. Uh, but when register pressure is high, they still have a lot of data movement operations. While direct memory um, machines, they have zero local data movements. Um, but you know, they, they do have a bit more complex arithmetization as well. So next up, let us look at uh, efficiency of representation, or basically how, much, uh, how many constraints we need to express one instruction. So if you were to plot the complexity of the constraints as a function of the number of cycles or instructions executed, you would get a graph roughly like this, which is piecewise linear, and where the graphs divide into segments. And the length of the x-axis for each segment is uh, what we call the segment cycle count. And the reason why most existing implementations do this uh, is twofold. One is there's this economy of scale for proving, meaning the uh, memory usage is usually linear in the uh, instance size, and the proving time is usually super linear uh, in, in the instance size. So therefore, it is more efficient to keep a smaller instance, meaning uh, a smaller segment. And secondly, these segments can then be proved in parallel, uh, meaning that if you have a lot of processors, a lot of computers, you can actually uh, have a, a lower delay if you break them into segments. And uh, however, breaking them down into segments, uh, it is not free. And we incur in some overheads if we want to prove that the machine state between segments are consistent. And moreover, if we want to compress all the proofs down to a single succinct proof, we need to do recursion. And uh, for some rough uh, numbers here for Stark VMs, the number of cycles in the segments is usually on the order of a uh, million cycles. But for something that's, uh, for example, Nova-based, uh, the, the segment count uh, could be you know, as low as one single instruction. So let us dive into the, uh, you know, what happens in a segment in more detail. And first, let us recall the notion of poly polynomial interactive oracle proofs, or poly, poly IOP for short. Um, in, in these type of protocols, we generally have a set of polynomials derived from the, the execution trace. And there are then additional constraints placed on these polynomials in terms of semantic checks, such as uh, permutation check, gate check, uh, lookups. So for example, a permutation check will check that the value of a polynomial is a permutation of the values of another polynomial. 
And these checks are then further turned into uh, ch uh, zero checks and product checks, which are then turned into quotient checks in the uh, univariate setting or some checks in the multivariate setting. And everything up to this point are information theoretic and incur minimal computation uh, in the form of mathematical finite field operations. To turn this into a existing snark, usually what we do is we have to add on a polynomial commitment scheme. And for that, it incurs a lot of finite field operations uh, in, in the form of FFTs, as well as uh, multilinear extensions. And most importantly, of course, polynomial commitments, which amounts to multiscalar multiplications in a group, or uh, for example, Merkle hashes if we're working with Fry. And so to put this into context of a uh, ZKVM, what happens is that we have an executor which takes a piece of program, some input, will spit out a um, list of execution traces, and each of the execution traces is then turned into a sequence of polynomials, which are then committed to and then opened at a set of random points. And the commitments and the openings constitute the proof. And if you were to look at the complexity of the operations here, it turns out these, the steps labeled uh, you know, currently in purple are the, the most heavy operations. And by a rough count, up to 80% of proving time could be spent in these two stages, uh, which consists, consists of mostly FFTs uh, and, and poly comments. And so for, for us to look at the second category of representation efficiency, we need to look at uh, this metric, which is basically how many polynomial uh, are derived or are, are there for the proof system, and how many polynomial evaluation points uh, do we need to additionally do for each instruction. So keep that in mind, that's the metric we're going to be looking for, for these systems. Uh, and roughly we have two categories uh, that we look at. Look at. Um, one is Stark VMs. So Carol really started uh, you know, building systems uh, that have this architecture, and there's a lot of many projects that have followed suit, such as ReZero, Maiden, and so on. And on the other side, we'll have algebraic Stark VMs, which are uh, actually currently mostly based on Halo 2. So I had to warn you a little bit, the next, next slide is going to be very dense uh, with numbers, and we're going to be walking through it uh, uh, step by step. So here is a spec sheet for uh, Stark VMs that we've collected. And the most important column here is the last two columns, which denotes uh, the bytes committed per instruction to be executed, uh, and the Fry expansion rate. So for Stark VMs, it turns out there's this tunable parameter called the Fry expansion rate that dictates the trade-off between proving speed and proof size. And it's mostly a tunable parameter, meaning uh, we, we have the numbers on, in this column, and we can pick a Fry expansion rate, and we get roughly the total amount of bytes to be committed per instruction. And, and that's after you pick the, you know, the third step, which is polynomial commitment scheme, you, you, get, you get roughly your, your, your time per instruction. And um, next up, let's look at how we derive this number. The first thing is uh, we had to fix a field. And it turns out for most Stark VMs, with the exception of Cairo, have chosen to uh, either use a 64-bit field, which is Goldilocks, or a 31-bit field, such as Baby Bear or, or Mercedes or 31. And there's always a set of base columns, which are usually simple uh, functions of the execution trace. And then there are a set of columns, which we call the randomized extension columns. These columns usually result in the semantic checks, such as uh, permutation arguments, lookups, and copies. And we can see that these VMs are generally using a small number of these operations, uh, with the exception of, uh, um, I guess, Polygon ZKVM here. Uh, and the reason why these uh, checks are expensive is that because of the randomization needed, we need to move to extension field, uh, since we, if we're in a small field setting. And this incurs a blow up of uh, the extension field degree factor, uh, which is you know, undesirable compared to base columns. Um, yeah, so. Here are the rough numbers that we have derived uh, using this framework. And uh, one caveat here is that this number is not supposed to be uh, you know, a comparison metric for, for these VMs because we're comparing apples to oranges. These are uh, different, ISA, uh, different ISAs with different efficiency, and the underlying PCIs could also be different. So 
Uh, but the takeaway message here is that even for the most efficient VMs, such as Maiden, Cairo, or Valida, the amount of bytes to be committed uh, is at least about like 1.5 to 2 kilobytes if you pick a fry expansion factor of 2. And uh, so, for example, for Maiden, if, if you pick a fry expansion factor of 8, then you could even have up to like you know, 5 or 6 kilobytes committed. Um, but you know, roughly, they're all, all within one order of magnitude, which is 2 to 10. Um, so keep that memory in mind, you'll come in handy. And the second thing to notice is that the operations uh, where, where bytes to be committed per instruction differs depending on the type of operation they are doing. In particular, for 32-bit binary operations, there are some VMs that are optimized for this and some other VMs that are, that are not. And this additionally could incur uh, order two blow up or up to like order 30 blow up on the, on the number of bytes to be committed per instruction. And a little bit of uh, uh, caveat here uh, when I was talking about the fry expansion factor is that uh, for a lot of VMs, there's actually optimization that can be, can be made where the fry expansion rates can be closely uh, you know, related to the max degree where you can eliminate uh, one of the you know, one set of FFTs. Uh, but I'm not going to be going to that in detail. So let's look at uh, Halo 2 VMs. Here, the story is roughly the same. We want to derive a number that is number of bytes committed per instruction. And uh, here, we'll have to use some very, very rough estimates here. Uh, so let me actually start on the, on the left here. For Halo 2 based VMs, we actually got some more granular numbers in terms of the number of lookups, permutations, and copy checks that are done uh, in, in these three VMs. And we can see that Halo 2 based VMs currently use a lot more lookups than uh, in the Starkland. Um, and we suspect that you know, it's because we, ha we could stay in the same field. So you know, intuitively speaking, there should, shouldn't be any efficiency difference between base columns and randomized columns. But however, actually, uh, this might not be the case because uh, the base columns could have low hemming rate, uh, hemming weight. So therefore, committing to base columns could be potentially more efficient than um, randomized extension columns, or randomized columns in this case. And for us here, we have picked a number of four bytes per base column and 32 bytes for a randomized column to derive these numbers. And roughly speaking, they're, again, on the same order of magnitude, but maybe slightly more kilobytes committed per instruction than Stark VMs. So uh, what are some learnings that we can take away here? Well, one is to minimize this number, we have to minimize the number of cells committed per instruction. And a lot of times, there are certain cells that's carried over, repeated across different cycles, such as registers, which uh, are essentially unnecessary uh, you know, to, to do as a column. And secondly, uh, there are some techniques that, uh, for example, improvements in lookup protocols that can be applicable for all VMs. And so, for example, a lot of Halo 2 VMs still use the Halo 2 lookup arguments, which can be directly replaced by more uh, you know, recent and faster lookup arguments. So next up, let's look at briefly at the uh, recursion complexity of uh, Snarks in general, actually. So recall the reason why we need recursion, uh, or the reason why we need to look at how to aggregate the segments because we need to make sure that they're consistent between segments and we want to derive a single succinct proof. And it turns out the, the way that you would tie the uh, segments together, it could incur up to around 50% uh, um, blow up in, in, the, in the number of cycles. Uh, and we took this number uh, from risk zero. And this could differ you know, depending on the, the strategy that you would prove that memory is consistent. And the next big kind of contributor to complexity will be um, the complexity of verifying a recursive proof. And for that, we have looked at three categories, uh, direct snark recursion, folding schemes, and start based recursion. Um, and for the, reason, for the uh, interest of time here, I will just skip to the uh, number slide here, where we kind of plug in the numbers for, um, you know, for, for everything. And so direct snark, snark recursion is definitely very inefficient uh, compared to Starks or folding schemes. And it is clear that folding schemes, if operated over a native uh, fields have clear advantage. However, Stark-based recursion could be efficient enough, uh, you know, as is for some practical systems. So, 
Finally, let us look at the final metric, uh, which is actually independent of ZKVMs, which is the time that it takes to, uh, you know, per, per, per gate or per, per cell. And for this, we have, we'll just have, you know, two short slides on this because we couldn't really find good data, and this is independent of ZKVMs. Here is a benchmark by Rumco showing the PCS commitment throughput for, uh, as a function of instance size. And we can see that Stark uh, commitment schemes are actually, well, Fry is faster than MSMs uh, on certain machines. And however, if you normalize a number by the field size, the number actually gets really close. And in some cases, MSMs actually wins out uh, over, over Fry for, for these implementations. And the second uh, data point that we have is from Ellie Slides from uh, SBC, which lists the cycles it costs to commit to a 32 byte value or 32 bit value. Um, and the number was given for, for Fry with Blake, Fry with Poseidon hash, and uh, MSM based commitment schemes. And there was kind of a reply to you from, from Zach correcting the numbers for MSMs, uh, bringing it down significantly. And so the, the story here is really that we don't, we don't really have good grasp of which one uh, is faster per byte. Uh, and it highly depends on the configuration, the hash that you use, and uh, you know, the, the MSM algorithm that you use. However, for, for Fry, it is clear that with more snark efficient hashes, we can significantly bring this number down. Um, so let me actually go back to this slide and, and conclude. Uh, so in this talk, we have presented this metric of analyzing the efficiency of the KVMs uh, into three different efficiency metrics. ISA efficiency, reorganization efficiency, proof system efficiency. The last one is independent of ZKVMs, and there's improvements to be made on all three categories. So let me conclude with perhaps a little bit of, uh, kind of questioning, you know, open questions that, that we can uh, try to solve. So for the, on the ISA front, is it clear that there's efficiency to, to be gained if we eliminate local data movement? Um, Reptilizations, it is clear that with more efficient snark based hash functions, Fry can gain a lot of uh, uh, efficiency in, in terms of the recursive complexity. And, and finally, for PCS, we should have better benchmark frameworks to be able to compare these. And moreover, there should be actual libraries that uh, um, you know, a lot of front ends can depend on instead of uh, the current landscape, which is every single uh, Stark library or every single Stark library having their own, well, having to code up their own uh, polymer commitment schemes. So with that, uh, I'll conclude the talk and take questions. Oh. And we thank this list of individuals who have given uh, great insights to these systems. Uh, many of you are you know, sitting in the audience today. So. so do we have any questions? Right. So um, I, I have a very quick question about whether you have an intuition about the trade-off between uh, stack and register machines. Because so in, in, it featured in, in both of the, of the first two segments in that it, it features in instruction complexity, but also in how many instructions you have because of uh, data movement. Did you get a feeling of, of an overall winner, or is it not clear from the data you have? So this is subjective, I think. My, th my feeling is that uh, direct memory, so operating on the call stack directly, uh, could, be, could be like more efficient than you know, having registers or having too many bits of the stack uh, because you have less instructions and it only incurs more memory reads and writes, uh, well, uh, more memory reads. And we, we know how to do those very efficiently uh, as a permutation argument. All right, um, thanks. Any other questions? Hey, thanks for the talk. So what's your take on the lookup singularity? Uh, oh, so one thing is we didn't really compare Jolt and Lasso here, um, and, and it would be nice to kind of put them into the same framework. And I think uh, based on the, you know, preliminary numbers that they're giving out, there's definitely improvements that have made, um, you know, bytes committed per instruction. So yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a nice, good step in the, in, in the right direction, but I'm not sure if, you know, we'll have a, like a single lookup for everything uh, anytime soon. 
Anyone else? We have a couple more minutes. Cool. Thank you. So oh, wait. Last minute. Last minute entry. Did you do any benchmarking comparison between development of similar circuits uh, as DSLs versus their implementation in a virtual machine? Oh, this is a really good question. So, um, yeah, so actually, if you look at our shot numbers, you can actually kind of derive, uh, this is a slide that I didn't show, which was uh, the complexity for Sean. Um, and so, you know, it takes about like 40 to 60K constraints in, in Plunkish. And if you look at, if you were to implement Sha in like RIS-5 or WASM, or in, in Rust, or compiled to RIS-5 and WASM, and then going through the calculations, um, I think you get, yeah, something like 10 to 100 times. So that's, that's how we got like 10 to 100 times slowdown number for one of the slides. Uh, um, yeah, so, so, you know, there's definitely inefficiencies like with going through, you know, a, a, a computation that's like expressing software and then going through a VM compared to like just directly doing nine circuits. Thank you. Cool. Anyone else? All right. Thank you so much, then. Thank you.